As a historian studying the history of the Netherlands, sometimes referred to as the Dutch Golden Age in the 17th century, it was an era characterized by unprecedented wealth in the Dutch Republic. Renowned artists like Rembrandt van Green and Johannes Vermeer created masterpieces and intellectual life flourished in cities such as Amsterdam and Delft. However, beneath this glamorous facade lies a troubling reality. Many of the wealthiest individuals in the Republic amass their fortunes through the enslavement, sale, and exploitation of African people. Unlike other countries involved in the slave trade, such as Portugal, Spain, Britain, France, and the USA, the Dutch have attempted to bury this truth and deny their role. Similar to Argentina's erasure of its black population from history, the Dutch strive for the world to forget their involvement. In fact, some Dutch writers even blame the victims of slavery, suggesting that African chiefs willingly sold their people to European traders. Despite efforts to conceal their dark past, this video will expose the brutal secrets of Dutch slavery, which decimated African civilizations, tore families apart, and treated human lives as mere commodities for buying and selling. From the early 17th to the mid-19th century, slavery played a fundamental role in the Dutch colonial empire. All overseas possessions of the Dutch dependent in varying degrees on the labor of slaves who were imported from diverse and often remote areas. Over the past decades, numerous academic publications have shed light on the history of the Dutch Atlantic slave trade and of slavery in the Dutch Americas. These scholarly contributions in combination with the social and political activism of the descendants of Caribbean slaves have helped to bring the subject of slavery into the national public debate. The fact that slavery also played a prominent role in the growth of the Dutch East India Company, or VOC, a prosperous organization notorious for its slave crimes, has seemingly been forgotten. This public ignorance merely reflects the state of academic scholarship on the subject. The topic of slavery has not been widely discussed among historians of the Dutch East India Company, and its absence in literature is not unique to the Dutch context. In contemporary society, whenever slavery is brought up, a defensive reaction often follows, suggesting that it was a natural and widely accepted institution until the abolitionist movement emerged. However, a closer examination reveals the deception in this argument. Early modern Dutch society, like most of Europe, no longer considered enslaving fellow Europeans morally acceptable. It was deemed suitable only for people of African or Asian descent. Fortunately, efforts to expose the Dutch role in slavery have led to changes, including discussions on an official apology, the erection of monuments, and the inclusion of slavery in the national history canon. In 2013, the Council of Churches issued an apology on the 150th anniversary of slavery abolition, and in 2023, Dutch King Willem Alexander formally apologized for the historic involvement in slavery and its lasting effects. The king acknowledged that over 600,000 individuals were transported by Dutch ships from Africa, with 75,000 losing their lives during the journey. The monarch also commissioned independent research into his family's involvement in the slave trade with results expected in 2026. According to a study published in early 2023, the House of Orange Nassau, the Royal House of the Netherlands, made around 600 million in today's money from slavery in the Dutch colonies between 1675 and 1770, including shares in the Dutch East India Company gifted to the family. Willem Alexander's apology comes in the midst of a larger reckoning with the Netherlands' involvement in the slave trade, in 2022, the country's Prime Minister Mark Rutte made a similar apology, acknowledging the Dutch state bears responsibility in the Atlantic slave trade and profited from it. The government also announced a fund of more than $200 million to increase awareness, involvement, and follow-up regarding the country's legacy of slavery. The Dutch were not only leading participants in the transatlantic slave trade, they were also the cruelest among the slave masters.
During the year 1624 to 1763, the Dutch were the most brutal of slave masters. The Dutch slave code was much harsher than the Spanish code. The savagery of the Dutch code is shown by one provision of calculated cruelty, the burning alive of mutinous slaves over a slow fire. The Dutch had no institution comparable to the Spanish Audiencia, a tribunal that included four judges. The Dutch's relentless actions led to a culmination in the Burbis Slave Rebellion, which took place in the mid-18th century in present-day Guyana. Burbis was a collection of Dutch plantations situated along a river of the same name. In 1763, an extraordinary uprising occurred, triggered by the harsh conditions endured by West African slaves who were captured, survived the transatlantic journey, and toiled under the scorching sun for long hours, six days a week, with minimal breaks. Disease, whippings, and torture were commonplace. After suppressing a local revolt in 1762, deep-seated resentments erupted the following year when the rebellious slaves launched their attack on a Sunday while the Dutch were attending church. The rebellion was led by Coffee, who envisioned a divided state where the Dutch would remain on one side of the Burbis River while the newly freed slaves occupied the other, fostering potential trade relations. Despite a year of unsuccessful negotiations, internal divisions and exhaustion led to a coup against Coffee, who, following West African tradition, took his own life. Today, a monument erected in 1763 commemorating Coffee, the leader of the slave rebellion, stands in the Revolution Square in Georgetown, the capital of Guyana. The Dutch later interrogated hundreds of the surviving slaves, leaving behind exceedingly rare records that reflect the voices of slaves from over two and a half centuries ago. In all, 124 people were executed. Some of the condemned were to have every bone broken on the rack with an iron bar before dying from either a mercy blow to the heart or a merciless blow to the skull. Others were to be burned at the stake with a regular fire, which took an hour or with a small fire, where the victim smoldered alive for four hours. Some individuals experienced the horrifying agony of having their flesh torn with hot pincers, while others were considered lucky if they were hanged. Unfortunately, but not surprisingly, slavery remains a taboo subject in the Netherlands a country that benefited greatly from it. Like many Europeans, the Dutch tend to embrace only those aspects of history that glorify their own achievements. Consequently, many Dutch people grow up and go through life without learning anything about the immense crime that contributed significantly to their current wealth. Some Dutch historians even go so far as to deny the substantial impact of Dutch involvement in the slave trade. To truly comprehend the Dutch influence in the slave trade, we must delve into the past and examine the centuries-long transatlantic slave trade. This trade operated through a well-documented triangular commercial system. European ships loaded with carefully selected goods would set sail from various ports in Western Europe to the West African coast. There, European merchants would exchange these goods for African slaves who were sold by local traders. The enslaved individuals were then transported to strategic locations in the Americas where they would be forced into labor. The ships would return to Europe carrying commodities like sugar, coffee, and tobacco, all produced by the enslaved individuals to be sold in the European market. It was a good example of the emergence of global trade in the early modern period. If the voyage went as planned, and this included keeping slave mortality on board to a minimum, investors stood to profit from several transactions. For the African victims, the Middle Passage was merely one part of their tragic journey to the Americas. First, they experienced enslavement, coerced transportation, and confinement in Africa itself, before being sold to what must have seemed strange white men, who subsequently moved them under excruciating circumstances across the Atlantic Ocean. Finally, after disembarking in the Americas, 
they often faced further regional trading and transport, for the great majority of them, backbreaking labor on large commercial plantations under the tropical sun loomed as the final destination. The forced alienation of those who survived this initial ordeal undeniably impacted their identity from local or tribal affiliations within Africa to a more diffuse African identity versus the Europeans on board and with the passage of time to the birth of uniquely African-American slave cultures. Due to its highly organized and businesslike character with slave embarkation, mortality, and disembarkation being meticulously registered, historians have been left with large amounts of administrative evidence from which the business volume and direction of the transatlantic slave trade can be reconstructed. At present, there are 12 and 37 officially documented Dutch slave voyages, with a total of 408,658 slaves departing from Africa. However, the actual numbers are an estimated total of 554,300 slaves exported by the Dutch, or roughly 4.4% of the overall volume of the transatlantic slave trade. And of these slaves, around 475,200 reached the Americas alive with a mortality rate of 14.3%. However, there are other accounts that state that more were transported, despite the inherent subjectivity of all assumptions, extrapolations, and estimations involved. Historians generally agree that slightly more than half a million Africans were transported on Dutch ships, with somewhere between 50,000 to 100,000 slaves perishing before they reached the New World. Given that their commercial activities on the African coast dated back to the mid-1590s, the Dutch took several decades before actively engaging in the slave trade. Initially, their African trade focused mainly on gold and, to a lesser extent, ivory. Even their first official settlement on the African coast, Fort Nassau at Moray on the Gold Coast, did not lead to significant involvement in the slave trade. This hesitation can be attributed to the absence of a suitable Dutch colony in the Americas. However, with a growing demand for slave labor due to the ongoing conflict with Spain and Portugal since 1508 Taos, Dutch privateers began targeting Iberian shipping, including Portuguese slave ships, as fair game. These captured slave ships resulted in what can be seen as an unplanned or incidental slave trade. Slaves carried by the enemy were considered contraband and were sold to the nearest friendly buyer whenever possible. The conquest of Pernambuco and other Portuguese captaincies in northeast Brazil in the early 1630s provided the Dutch West India Company with the richest sugar-producing region in the world, which had already developed into a full-fledged slave society. Dutch West India Company officials soon realized that without slaves, the sugar cultivation industry was at risk. Once the surrounding rural areas were pacified, the Dutch West India Company expanded its commercial interests on the African coast by capturing well-established Portuguese trading posts. Previous attempts had failed. But victories at Arguin in 1633, Elmina in 1637, and Sao Paulo de Luanda and Sao Tome in 1641 ensured unprecedented Dutch dominance along the African coast. Never would the Dutch have easier access to slaves than during the 1640s. The history of Dutch Brazil can be divided into three acts. First, the conquest and consolidation of a sizable territory for sugar cultivation, followed by a decade of relative peace and prosperity under the enlightened governorship of Johann Maurits van Nassau, and finally renewed warfare with the local Portuguese colonists, leading to the ultimate surrender of the colony in 1654. During the government of Maurits, 1,000s of slaves were imported by the Dutch West India Company, heralding the official involvement by the Dutch in the transatlantic slave trade. Initially, the majority of slaves were acquired from the Calabar region, encompassing the Slave Coast Bight of Benin and the Bight of Biafra, as well as the area north of the Congo River. However, the Dutch, influenced by the preferences of Portuguese Brazilian sugar planters for Angolan slaves, seized control of the main port of Luanda in 1641. The significant increase in slave imports and sugar exports in the 1640s 
abruptly halted when hostilities broke out after Moritz, a Dutch military leader, returned to Europe. Sugar plantations and mills were destroyed or ceased production across the board. While the Dutch slave trade to Brazil may not have had as profound a historical impact as the incidental slave deliveries to other parts of the New World in previous decades, the Dutch did introduce more slaves from West Africa to Brazil, primarily from the slave coast. This likely included the first Igbo people from the Bight of Biafra in Pernambuco. The war had a dramatic and liberating effect on the lives of slaves in Brazil. New slaves arriving from Angola could no longer be sold or supported by the Dutch West India Company. The Hogarod and Recife, two Dutch entities, pleaded with their Dutch West India Company colleagues in Luanda to stop sending slaves across the Atlantic. The slaves who had already arrived were redirected northward. In January 1646, the Tamandare sailed with a cargo of slaves from Fernando de Noronha, passing through Barbados and eventually reaching New Amsterdam, present-day New York. The relatively easy sale of these slaves hinted at future developments. As Dutch Brazil descended into the chaos of civil war in the mid-1640s, the Dutch West India Company faced a dilemma regarding the slave trade. Their short-lived supremacy on the African coast had been undermined when the Portuguese recaptured Luanda and Sao Tome in 1648, and English slaving activities were expanding. To address this situation, the Dutch sought to open new markets for slaves in the English and French Caribbean by introducing sugar cultivation based on slave labor, closely resembling the Brazilian model. The first Navigation Act in 1651, established under Cromwell, was mainly intended to suppress Dutch trade to the English colonies and fueled the growing animosity between the two maritime superpowers, eventually leading to three naval wars between 1652 and 1674. Increasingly stifled by the mercantilist policies of England and France, the Dutch looked ironically perhaps to the colonies of their former enemy, Spain, to provide new markets for the slave trade. Between 1646 and 1657, Dutch traders sold about 3,800 slaves to Santo Domingo, Puerto Rico, and Tierra Firme, while between 1657 and 1663, 14 Dutch slave ships arrived in Buenos Aires in the Rio de la Plata region alone. It is in this volatile arena that the emergence of Curaçao as a slave trade entrepot for the Spanish Americas should be situated. No longer useful as a military base, now that the war with Spain had ended and never entirely suited for commercial plantation agriculture, the company was desperately looking for another niche. For the next half century, Curaçao would take advantage of the Aussie Shinto trade receiving saltwater slaves from Africa and distributing them to the Spanish Americas according to contracts made in Europe. The Aussie Shinto contracts were renewed and reconfigured several times during the second half of the 17th century, thereby consolidating the Dutch position as a major player in the transatlantic slave trade. Altogether, almost a 100,000 slaves, or roughly 20% of the entire Dutch slave trade, accordingly found their way to the Spanish Americas between 1658 and 1729, with a sizable number from the slave coast, thus further diversifying the ethnic makeup of the Spanish colonies. Except for their short layover at Curaçao and their impact on the island economy, most of these Africans quickly disappeared from the Dutch colonial realm. And while this transit trade enhanced the historic reputation of the Dutch as slave traders, the slaves themselves ended up in Spanish, not Dutch colonies, with Curaçao evolving into Amsterdam's Caribbean counterpart. During the 1650s and 1660s, other Dutch colonies in the Americas received only a small number of slaves. Governor Peter Stuyvesant of New Netherland repeatedly requested slaves from Curacao, but only a few actually arrived. The main factor determining where surplus or unwanted slaves were sold was sound business acumen rather than national solidarity. 
These slaves were typically sold closer to their place of arrival, often at better prices. New Netherlands simply couldn't compete with the Caribbean plantation colonies in terms of their demand for slave labor. It was considered a peripheral destination in the slave trade, even though the small number of slaves that did arrive laid the foundation for a thriving African-American community. An American community. The Peace Treaty of Breda, which ended the Second Anglo-Dutch War and resulted in the exchange of New Netherland for Suriname, greatly influenced the future of the Dutch transatlantic slave trade. For the next 150 years, the Dutch colonial possessions in the Americas remained largely unchanged. The unsuccessful colonization attempts in New Holland, or Dutch Brazil, and New Netherland, Dutch New York, made the West India Company leaner and more focused, with a heavy concentration on the Lower Caribbean. This alignment suited the financial and structural reorganization of the company in the early 1670s. Curacao experienced its golden age as a slave trade entrepreneur to the Spanish Americas, while Suriname emerged as the quintessential Dutch plantation colony. The prospects for the slave trade appeared promising. During this period, Curacao and Suriname were the primary beneficiaries of the Dutch slave trade, receiving almost equal numbers of slaves. However, there was a crucial difference. Most slaves sent to Curacao were then transferred to Spanish colonies, while Suriname served as their final destination. Between 1676 and 1716, over 42,000 African slaves arrived in Curacao and were distributed among Spanish traders. However, after the War of Spanish Succession from 1702 to 1713, when the Aussie Shinto contracts fell into the hands of the English, the slave trade to Curaçao rapidly declined. This had immediate effects on the island's economy and the activities of local company slaves. It also led to a rapid creolization of the African-American population and the sustained growth of a free black community. During the 1730s, the West India Company relinquished its monopoly on the transatlantic slave trade, leading to the emergence of a large private slave trade and the end of its illegal for runners, the interlopers. Companies such as the MCC and the Rotterdam-based firm of Rochusen were now mainly responsible for delivering slaves to Suriname and the smaller Dutch plantation colonies on the wild coast like Berbets. Essequibo, and Demerara. As a consequence, the historic connections between Zeeland and the Wild Coast were rekindled with almost 80% of the Dutch private slave trade organized by companies from that maritime province. The extent to which this trade expanded dramatically in the mid-18th century, before decreasing just as rapidly during the latter decades, becomes evident due to the state of the surname Plantation Society itself, which suffered from a financial crisis and limited profitability, partly related to the continuous resistance of the Maroon communities. It was also due to the general decline of the Dutch Republic, no longer a major player in Europe, with English supremacy in the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War confirming the loss of their maritime prowess. The Dutch's inability to keep up with economic progress was swiftly met by increased involvement in slave trading by the British and the United States. During the 1780s and 1790s, a total of 7,011 slaves were brought to Suriname on American ships, while the British focused primarily on Essequibo and Demerara, particularly after occupying these colonies in 1795. Although the colonies were later returned to Dutch control during the era of the Batavian Republic from 1795 to 1805, this move disappointed even the Dutch planters. Six Dutch slave voyages between 1802 and 1803 transported an estimated 1,287 slaves to Suriname. More than six decades later, the Dutch formally abolished slavery, with the Netherlands officially ending the practice in 1863. However, it took another 10 years before the enslaved people truly experienced their freedom. Slavery persisted for an additional decade as many individuals were coerced into working on plantations to minimize financial losses for the owners. Consequently, many descendants of the slaves consider 1873 rather than 1863 as the true date of abolition.
In comparison, England declared abolition in 1834, France in 1848, and the USA in 1865. Therefore, the Netherlands was among the last nations to end this reprehensible crime. In terms of decolonization in Africa, the Dutch were also one of the final powers to withdraw, particularly in South Africa. The Dutch king's shocking apology for the country's participation in the brutal slave trade and other actions to acknowledge and confront the history of slavery came as a response to critics who urged the Netherlands to openly acknowledge its role instead of hiding from the truth. Hopefully, other nations, such as Portugal, Spain, Belgium, the United States, France, and Britain, will soon follow suit and offer restitution for centuries of slavery and the resulting poverty inflicted upon African communities within their borders and on the African continent.